Kenny Ongle Kian was 28. She had everything to live for. In 1995, she had left Malaysia to pursue an education and later a successful career as an IT analyst in San Diego, California, and married American Brandon Ong. The couple were blissfully happy. But in 2003, Kenny's father, Ong Bi Jeng, is diagnosed with cancer. Her mother, Pearlie, remembers telling Kenny the distressing news. As soon as she heard that, she went into the net, all right, and tried to find out what cancer he had. Kenny, the family's eldest child, is shocked by what she discovers about her father's illness. She makes an immediate decision to return home to Malaysia to help her family through its ordeal. For her, family always comes first. He said, Mommy, Daddy had rare, had a very rare cancer. I must come back, I must come back. When she came back, she went straight to the hospital to see the father. Back in Kuala Lumpur, Kani devotes most of her time caring for her father. It is only when she is satisfied that he is at last on the mend after a successful surgery that she feels she can return home to the United States. On the eve of her departure, Kenny invites her mother and some of her closest friends to a farewell get-together at a restaurant at the upmarket Bangsar Shopping Center, Kuala Lumpur. She was really excited about getting everybody together for a farewell dinner. So the day before, she said, uh, Noreen, you know, can you organize it? I was like, yeah, no problem. That night, Kenny and her mother, Pearlie, arrive late and rush to find a parking space in the mall. Pearlie remembers a sense of foreboding as they drive into the mall's underground parking lot. Actually, I found the place a bit dark. And I also remarked to Kenny, I said, how come the place is so dark? As they are in a hurry, Pearlie shrugs off her concern. After parking the car, the pair rush to the restaurant. Halfway, she suddenly turned around and told me that she forgot, she has forgotten the ticket in the car. But I don't know what made her change her mind. So, you know, oh, she said, never mind. I will go down and get it myself after the dinner. Kenny and her friends and family have a lot to celebrate. Kenny's father is recovering at last, and she is clearly bubbling over with happiness and looking forward to being reunited with her husband, Brandon. When we saw Kenny, I knew that she was at the prime of her life because I've never seen her so happy and so confident and so contented with her life. Kenny has been away a long time and wants to make a night of it with her friends. But she notices that her mother is getting tired and decides to walk her to her car, then return later. Kenny said, okay, why don't you wait? Um, you just wait right here, Noreen, and I'm gonna send my mom to the car and, uh, and then I'm gonna come back again and then you know we'll hang out for a little bit and then, then we'll, I'll jump in your car and then we can go and meet some of our other friends. At the parking ticket machine, Canny, her sister Elsie, and Pearlie join the queue to pay. Then Canny remembers that she left the ticket in the car. So she asked me to wait there. And before I can say anything, she went off already. I couldn't follow her because my, my feet were hurting me. It is a short distance to the car, but after 20 minutes, there is no sign of Canny. Anxiously, Elsie begins calling her sister's mobile. There is no answer. You keep on going to the voice box. Suddenly I became panicky early. Something is clearly wrong. Pearlie and her daughter rush down to the parking bay where Canny had parked earlier in the evening. To Pearlie's disbelief, her car, a Proton Tiara, has vanished. And Canny is nowhere to be seen. Distressed, Pearlie and Elsie hurry back to the restaurant. Confused by Canny's baffling disappearance, her friends call her mobile again and again, but it always switches straight to voicemail. It was really odd for her to just like, disappear, especially if her mother was waiting for her. So I called, when I called her again, then uh, it rang and then the phone got switched off. So that was already like alarm bells going off in my head at that time. 
Pearlie notices that there are CCTV cameras located all over the parking lot and turns desperately to the security guards for help, hoping they know what has happened to her daughter. We told them that the guys disappeared. The Kenyans disappeared. So he said, can we look at the CCTV? But the guard told us, oh, you have to wait until after midnight. The security guards finally relent. Just before midnight, Pearlie and Kenny's friends are permitted to view the CCTV footage. What they see is a terrible shock. The CCTV shows Pearlie's proton car speeding through the car park and then smashing through the barrier. There is a dimly visible stranger at the wheel with a woman cowering beside him. Pearlie and Noreen watch the footage in horror. When I saw the car being driven through the parking barrier, it was like, you know, all the worst fears was like starting to come true. And at the same time, you just really, I just couldn't believe that that was happening. Pearlie is devastated by what the CCTV footage reveals. She immediately makes a police report about her daughter's disappearance and likely abduction. Refusing to sit still, Pearlie, Noreen, and Kenny's friends drive back and forth across Kuala Lumpur, hoping desperately to spot Kenny or Pearlie's car. In the meantime, her husband Brandon has called, trying to reach his wife. Noreen must break the devastating news about Kenny's shocking disappearance. I had to explain to him a couple of times because he just couldn't understand how that could have happened. So I was trying to, you know, stay calm for him, but at the same time, I'm in complete panic mode. Their search is in vain. At 4 a.m., exhausted and full of dread, Pearlie and Noreen return home empty-handed. So the whole night I was waiting. I couldn't sleep. It was very, I felt very cold. 72 hours pass, and there is no sign of Kenny. Frustrated, Pearlie and her husband turn to the press. At the Malaysian Chinese Association, they make a public appeal, pleading with Kenny's abductor to return her safely to her family and husband. Crime journalist Faye de Cruz was present at the press conference that day. Having reported many kidnapping cases in her career, she remembers being pessimistic about the outcome. I, I think I've covered over 20 kidnapping cases and so far all of them ransom demanded within the hour. As the days pass with no news and no sign of a demand for ransom, Kenny's family and friends begin to fear the worst. It is 96 hours since 28-year-old IT analyst Kenny Ong vanished from one of Kuala Lumpur's most prestigious neighborhoods. Kenny's husband, Brandon, is anxiously following developments from 14,000 kilometers away in San Diego, California. Pearly Ong recalls the conversation with her son-in-law. He kept on asking me, Mommy, did they find her? And then every time I told him, no, he would scream, he would start screaming. So I told him, I said, Brandon, please don't scream. Then he said, Mommy, how can I not scream? She's my wife. By now, the media and the public are closely following developments, and many share the family's mounting fears. Abu Bakar Mustafa is head of the criminal investigation department at that time. Oleh karena ini menarik perhatian ramai, maka sewajarnya lah ada perasaan tekanan pada pihak polis yang menjalankan tugas. Everywhere you went, people were, were talking about it, but they weren't sure what to make out of it. In that same week, so many bodies were found. The minute a body was found, everybody would rush to the scene, you know, only to find out it's not her. Then, the police make a disturbing discovery, an abandoned car that fits the description of Pearlie's missing vehicle. Kita dapati daripada siasatan bahawa kereta yang tersebut ialah kereta kepunyaan Pearly sendiri. Pearl Proton Tiara. They said when they discover her car, I knew it was here. 
I mean, something terrible happened already. Police investigators also find that the front right tire is punctured and there is blood on the back seat. Then, four days after Canny's disappearance, a construction site worker makes a gruesome discovery close to where Pearlie's proton was found. Inside a manhole and concealed beneath two vehicle tires lies a badly burned body. The Royal Malaysian Police Forensics Unit is immediately dispatched to the scene. The team is led by Superintendent Amidon Anan. Saya dapati ada macam bau getah terbakar. Saya pergi intai, tengok macam ada rangka, rangka manusia. The body has been partly crushed by the two heavy tires, which are filled with cement and has burns on 90% of the skin's surface. Whoever dumped the body clearly wanted to make it hard to identify. Keadaan mangsa atau mayat ketika itu dari paras pinggang ke bawah hancur. Saya rasa pelik kenapa ada ikatan atas kedua-dua tangan. Within the hour, journalists are swarming all over the crime scene. There was a strong stench of dead body. It wasn't very nice being there. I mean, I could smell it on my clothes for a few days after that. Yeah, it, it doesn't leave your skin. There's a likelihood that orang ni lah orang yang dilaporkan hilang. Tetapi kita masih perlu, kita masih perlu investigate sehingga tahap benar-benar kita boleh katakan orang ini lah orang yang berkaitan. The body is taken to the University Hospital mortuary for autopsy. Reports about the discovery of the charred human remains are soon splashed all over the front pages of Malaysia's major newspapers, complete with a grisly picture of the body. For Canny's mother, Pearlie, the explicit newspaper reports confirm her worst fears. I just happened to glance at the Chinese newspaper and I saw them carrying Kenny, and I knew it was Kenny already, but I didn't tell anyone. I could see her hair. To proceed with the formal identification of the mutilated corpse, the investigating officers request that Kenny's closest friend, Noreen, and her sister, Nurul, come to the hospital mortuary. The experience is too much for Noreen. I started walking towards the door, and I could see that, you know, the crack of the door there, and it was just a couple of steps away, and the smell was just horrific. It was really overwhelming. I couldn't make myself go through the door. I could, I could already see where she was lying. Severely traumatized, Noreen turns to her sister, Nurul, who volunteers to enter the mortuary instead. After only a few minutes, Nurul emerges. She is clearly distraught. She came out crying and, and she said, it's her, it's her. And I was like, how do you know that? I asked her so many times, how can you be sure? How can you be sure it's her? You can't. And she just said, it's the jeans she's wearing because that's my jeans. She borrowed it for me. And at that moment, it was, I could, it just felt like all hope was gone. Noreen calls Pearlie to try and prepare her for the very worst. And Pearlie, he said, you know, they discover our body, but we cannot be 100% sure, lah, you see. I mean, she's also trying to give me a, a little bit of hope. The father of Kenny Ong Lei Kian, 29, who was kidnapped in Bangsa on Friday, has identified the dress and the jewellery found on the body as that of his daughter. The parents of Kenny Ong, who was kidnapped from a shopping complex in Bangsa on Friday, were at the University of Malaya Medical Center mortuary to identify the body. They were immediately informed of the post-mortem results. Kenny's father, Ong Bi Jing, 64, said his family still hoped that the DNA test will prove the body was not that of his daughter. That fragile shred of hope is soon extinguished forever. Dental records and DNA testing confirm beyond any doubt that the body is that of Kenny Ong. 
The forensic analysis reveals another shocking detail. Kenny was likely to have been raped. Forensic pathologist dapat uh, mengambil sedikit uh, kesan air mani di bagian da, bagian uh, dalam bagian dalam ni uh, di rimangsa. For the police, this forensic evidence suggests that they are dealing with a ruthless killer and rapist. And this deadly predator is still at large, somewhere in Kuala Lumpur. Ini adalah satu kes yang unik. Kerana ia melibatkan seorang yang saya kata, saya anggap pada mula sebagai seorang yang pakar. Seorang pakar dalam kebunuhan. Dan cara-cara ia mencuba melenyapkan mangsa ialah begitu pandai dan begitu lancar. The hunt is on for Kenny Ong's killer. Evidence gathered at the construction site where Kenny's remains had been discovered shed little light on the identity of the killer. So far, no witnesses have come forward. But then, a few days later, there is a shattering new development. An undercover policeman, Corporal Ravi Chandran, comes forward to reveal that he has crucial information about the case. Ravi Chandran tells investigators an extraordinary story. On the night Kani disappeared, he was on duty in a high crime area of Kuala Lumpur. Masa itu saya bersama anak sekolah perempuan buat rodan di kawasan perindustrian. Sebelum kami masuk ke kawasan perindustrian itu, kami nampaklah sebuah kereta parking di tepi jalan. Suspicious, Ravi Chandran decided to investigate. Ketuk pintu, tak tinggap lah kan? Ketuk tingkap. Lepas tu tingkap dibuka lah. Buka separuh je lah. Lepas tu dalam kereta tu, saya nampak lah satu lelaki Melayu dengan satu lelaki Cina lah. So, saya tanya pada pemandu kereta tu, Cik buat apa? So, dia beritahu lah, tak ada apa Cik. Uh, ini sudah free hire. Ada masalah lah. Masalah family kan, nak bincang. Unconvinced by the driver's explanation, Ravi Chandran requested the couple's ID cards. From these, he identified the driver as Ahmad Najib bin Aris and the passenger as Ong Lei Kian. As he continued to question the driver, Ravi Chandran noticed that the woman next to him was making clear signs of distress. <laughs> So Ravi Chandran asked the woman, Ong Lei Kian, to step out of the car. But the driver spoke angrily to his anxious passenger. The situation soon turned hostile. The proton then disappeared into the night, but Ravi Chandran still had the two identification cards. For police investigators, the discovery of the two cards is a critical breakthrough. After just three days, the police have the name of a suspect who may have been the last person seen with Kani Ong on the night she was abducted and brutally murdered. Malaysian IT analyst Kani Ong has been found brutally murdered. Her body dumped and burned almost beyond recognition inside a manhole. The news shocks Malaysia and there is an outpouring of grief and sympathy from the public. Kani's funeral is held at the Church of St. Francis Xavier in Pataling Jaya. Brandon Ong, Kani's husband, has flown from California, crushed by grief. Brandon was like, you know, hugging the casket and uh, there were times that he was on his knees and he was crying and sobbing uncontrollably and saying her name. He was just so devastated. We had to, we had to calm him down, you know, and hug him and console him. Hundreds of ordinary Malaysians join the family to mourn this young woman whose life has been so brutally cut short. 
actually the public they were very supportive. Many of them wrote to me, they wanted to talk to me, but at the time I didn't want to talk to anyone. I just wanted to be alone. Photographs of the grieving family have a powerful impact on the Malaysian public. But it only takes a few days for a wave of conspiracy theories to surface in the media. One of the most poisonous is that Kenny somehow knew her killer. The speculation is especially painful for Kenny's grieving mother. And these people talk nonsense. You know, she come back, she goes out with her boyfriend. What nonsense is this? She came back to see the father. Maybe have the time to see his boyfriend soon. And I understand that they said that this uh, guy knows her also. It's ridiculous. Uh. I mean, the thing they say to these people, it was really ridiculous. A huge police manhunt is now underway for the man last seen with Kani Ong, Ahmad Najib bin Aris. For the police, it is vital that the suspect is not alerted to the net rapidly closing around him. Sehingga orang ini dapat dikesan, saya tidak mau dedahkan bahawa kita sedang berusaha. Sebarang silap, silap langkah, silap cakap akan menunjukkan bahawa kita sedang menumpu pada satu sasaran. Dan sasaran yang kita nak tumpu ni ialah sasaran yang liar. Satu liar, bermakna orang yang yang akan hilang the police already have some vital clues. On the night Kani was murdered, undercover policeman Corporal Ravi Chandran sees two ID cards, Kani's and the suspects. Usaha-usaha untuk mencari sasaran gagal pada mulanya. Kerana ia telah memberi alamat yang tidak betul. Ini orang yang membahaya, yang boleh mengelakkan diri daripada di di kau di kesal di polis. Police investigators soon find out that Najib has left a long trail of these false addresses with various official agencies, including falsified employment records. But they do have other ways to hunt down the man on the ID card. They look for the suspect's name in the National Social Security Agency and Marriage Registry and are immediately rewarded. There is an Ahmad Najib bin Aris listed as married, and he works as an aircraft cabin cleaner. Next, police track down his wife's workplace. For two days, an undercover team stakes out the local bank where Najib's wife works as a clerk, and then follows her commute home. They hope she will lead them to their main suspect. Tiny is not critical. Kerana kesilapan pergakai ini melibatkan kita kelepasan peluang ini. The police keep the presumed residence of their prime suspect under observation, but for three anxious days there is no sign of Ahmad Najib bin Aris. Then, at around 4 a.m. on July 20th, 2003, the police team spot their suspect getting out of a taxi and walking towards his home. They immediately arrest him on suspicion of murdering Kani Ong. And he's taken for questioning to Pataling Jaya police station. The capture of the prime suspect in the notorious case of Kani Ong dominates front page news. But at first sight, Najib doesn't look like a ruthless murderer and rapist. I think until now, if you speak to a lot of people, they still find it hard to believe that this guy would do it, you know? And why? Because he has no past record. Many others share the same disbelief. One of his neighbors, a lawyer, Rosal Aziman, knew Najib as just a regular guy. He's not that kind of a person who, is, who might do crime, so he's quite surprised. He's uh, quite active in the community services, he involved in uh, malls, in the uh, weddings. But for criminologist Dr. Gashina Ayu Matsaat, an expert on the criminal mind, this anomaly is all too typical of a certain species of killer. He doesn't look the part. Now that's the thing a lot of people don't understand. They don't look the part. They look like normal individuals. 
For the introverted killer with psychopathic tendencies, they can separate the different aspects of their life. On one hand, they're the perfect father figure. They may be the perfect worker, perfect employee even. On the other hand, there's a darker side to their nature, which no one else knows about. Investigators soon find out that they are dealing with a very devious individual. From the start of their interrogation, it seems as if Najib wants to be in control, insisting that he speak only to the head of the Criminal Investigations Department, Abu Bakar Mustafa. Najib also seems to be well prepared. Abu Bakar considers he anticipated being arrested. Orang biasa akan kata, saya tak buat itu, tak buat ini. Biasanya. Saya tak salah, saya tak terlibat. Saya tengok air muka dia tidak terkejut. Biasanya orang ada menunjukkan ekspresi tertentu, tapi ini tak ada. Jadi menguatkan andaian saya bahawa, bahawa dia seorang yang bukan orang yang kita tak boleh pandang rendah pada dia. During this first period of questioning, Najib proves himself to be a sly adversary. Dia menggunakan satu taktik memusing ke arah polis. Dia hendak polis kalau beritahu, kita tahu something, dia mengesahkan. But as the hours pass and the police repeatedly confront Najib with the evidence they have against him, he begins to weaken. Police confront Najib with the two ID cards taken the night of the murder, strongly linking Najib to Kani. And most damning, a blue jacket, a red t-shirt, and a pair of blue jeans, all stained with blood. The police relentlessly pile on the pressure. Najib finally gives in and confesses that he abducted and murdered Kani Ong. Bila dia tahu dia tidak boleh berdolak dalik, dia terima fakta itu. Itu akhirnya dia kita dapat keterangan daripada dia. But a confession given before a police officer does not carry as much weight as a confession given to a magistrate. So on the morning of June 21, 2003, the police bring Najib to the magistrate's court in Pataling Jaya, where his confession will be formally recorded and witnessed. Since his arrest, Najib has had no legal representation. So his family engages a lawyer who was also a former neighbor, Rosal Azimin. He rushes to speak to Najib. I asked him, are you OK? So he said, yeah, I want to make a confession. He said, the police knows everything. The police wants me to confess in court. He told me that. So I said, no, no, this is not the time for you to confess anything or to admit anything or to deny anything. Just say that you want a lawyer and you're going to proceed with the case. But Rosal's intervention is too late. Najib's confession is already on record. Rosal realizes that his client is in very deep trouble. So Rosal turns to a highly experienced criminal defense lawyer, Hanif Katri Abdullah. We do not actually know what actually happened at that time. And that is the role of a defense lawyer, to find out from his client what was his relationship to that crime and then raise the necessary doubts pertaining to his defense. But while Najib remains in police custody, he has only limited access to his lawyers and in the circumstances, agrees to help police reconstruct the sequence of gruesome events that led to the death of Kani Ong. Dan only orang yang let, bawa letak barang di situ akan boleh bawa kita ke situ. Kerana dia yang tahu dia letak situ. Jadi beberapa tempat yang kita bagi itu, kita dapati bahawa ada kesan-kesan yang kemudian diguna pakai sebagai concrete evidence. Evidence yang concrete pada kita untuk bentangan kes ini. Najib first leads the police to the Bangsar car park where Kani vanished on the night of June 13, 2003. A police videographer records the remarkable sequence of events, shown here for the first time on television. In the course of the next few hours, Najib reveals in horrifying detail how he kidnapped, raped and murdered Kani Ong. Ahmad Najib bin Aris has been arrested for the murder of 28-year-old Kani Ong. 
After intense police interrogation, he confesses to the crime and agrees to take part in a reconstruction of the sequence of events that led to Kenny's gruesome end. Oleh kerana kita dapat ni direct daripada seorang yang bawa maka tanpa paksaan tanpa tanpa dengan trailer dengan dia sendiri bawa maka kita tidak ragu-ragu bahawa ini ialah tanggungjawab dia. The police take Najib to the Bangsar shopping center parking lot where Kenny was abducted after a farewell dinner with her family and friends. Najib proves to be astonishingly forthcoming about the events that unfolded that night. He reveals that he spotted Kenny searching for something inside a car. Then seizing his chance, he shoved her inside. She immediately went into a state of shock. He then reversed the car and headed out at high speed, smashing through the car park barriers. Najib explains to Superintendent Amidon Anan how he was able to ensure his victim did not escape. Lepas dia keluar dalam perjalanan itu, Najib ada cerita dia tak suka pisau. You menjerit, you minta tolong, dia akan bunuh. Najib informs Amidon that he then took Kani on a terrifying joyride, finally stopping in an industrial area just outside Kuala Lumpur. It was at this point that the parked proton was spotted by undercover policeman Ravi Chandran, who took Kani and Najib's ID cards. After this encounter, which ended with the car speeding away, Najib then stopped the car on the edge of a construction site. It was here that he raped Kani on. Head of CID Abu Bakar is astonished that in the circumstances, Najib's mind is fixated on sexual gratification. Kalau orang biasa yang tidak kuat sexual desire-nya, dia akan pulih dan ambil IC. Tentu dia tak berani, dia lari saja, tinggal, abandon dan tinggal. Tapi dia boleh lagi ambil masa untuk contemplate, untuk merogol lagi. Najib provides the investigators with even more shocking information about his actions that night. After raping Kenny, he drove the car to a quieter area. Here, he raped Kenny a second time, then stabbed her twice in the stomach. Kenny began to bleed profusely. Najib tells investigators that he panicked and decided he had to get rid of the dying woman. So he lifted the mortally wounded Kani from the blood-stained rear seat and dragged her over the barrier, separating the road from a construction site. Najib propped Kani against a concrete slab while assessing what to do next. He noticed a nearby manhole with its cover removed and decided to use it to conceal his victim. It was at this moment, Najib tells police, he and the dying Kani Ong heard the morning call to prayer. Superintendent Amidon believes that this was the last sound Kani ever heard. Ini Najib cerita pada saya sendiri ya. Dia cerita itu masjid ada bunyi uh, abang balik uh, balik sembahyang, saya pun mau sembahyang. Itu Najib cerita. Lepas tu Najib betulkan tangan dia, letak atas tu betulkan. Najib pun balik ke rumah dia. As Najib left Kani to bleed to death, her best friend Noreen and her mother Pearly were searching desperately for her just kilometers away. I just prayed that she was okay, you know, and just just um, prayed that God would do something. There really wasn't anything, anything else that we could do. Sometime that morning, Kani Ong died. Sixteen hours later, Najib returned with a can of petrol. He doused Kani's body and set it alight. Tujuan dia nak destroy atau nak, nak musnahkan bahan bukti, nak musnahkan saksi. Tak termusnah. For the police, Najib's reconstruction of the entire abduction and murder in such grisly detail seems to show beyond any reasonable doubt that he is the man who murdered Kani Ong. 
Najib must now face the judgment of the law. On September 15, 2003, Ahmad Najib bin Aris appears in the Pataling Jaya High Court, accused of the rape and murder of Kani Ong Le Kyan on the morning of June 14, 2003. A huge crowd of onlookers gathers outside the court, all desperate to catch a glimpse of the man accused of committing one of Malaysia's most gruesome murders. Lead prosecutor Salahuddin Saidin recalls the pressure on the prosecuting team to make sure justice is done. The trust is on me to handle the case properly. And of course, the public also expect high level of prosecutions and uh, for us not to let the accused person to let go just like that. For the first time, Kani's friends and family come face to face with the man who confessed to murdering Kani. That moment was, it's just so ingrained in my memory because he turned back when they called my name and he turned back and he looked at me and he smiled. He just looked so sick in the mind, you know, really, really twisted for him to, to smile, this kind of wicked smile. And I just knew, I really knew in my heart that that was him and it just took all of my strength not to look away because I just knew that this was the last person that Kenny saw. In spite of Najib's confession, his defense team headed by Hanif Katri Abdullah aims to secure an acquittal for their client. So Najib pleads not guilty. The court is stunned by this latest turn of events. For the prosecution, it's not good news, for their case relies on circumstantial evidence. When we started to gather evidence, there is no direct evidence. You know, no one saw the incident. No one saw the accused person committed the crime. Hanif and his formidable six-man defense team are determined to exploit every possible weakness of the prosecution case. What we see may not actually be what we see or what appears to be seen. That is why each and every accused needs to be defended, however gruesome the finding is. The defense team begins by trying to undermine the CCTV footage, which was such a vital part of the prosecution case. You can never figure out the image of the person in the photographs exactly to match it with Ahmad Najib or anyone because it was blurred. There were few copies of one photograph which was like facing the camera, which were enhanced three or four times to a certain size, and it was still very blurred. Crucial to the prosecution case are the blood-stained jeans and t-shirt discovered at Najib's home. But Hanif finds a way to question the validity of this evidence. The prosecution's witness, especially the investigating officer, confirmed there were no tests done to ask or to fit the trousers to Ahmad Najib. He never even checked the size of the jeans or measured the waist of Ahmad Najib. But prosecutor Salehuddin returns fire with evidence far more potent. DNA tests confirm that the blood found on Najib's jeans, t-shirt and jacket all belong to Kani Ong. And the semen found in Kani's remains proves just as damning. After the analysis, they found out that the semen belongs to uh, Najib and uh, the DNA profile proved that, that it belongs to Najib. This is powerfully incriminating evidence. But Hanif and his defense team still have another strategy to play. He points out to the court that Kani had a black belt in the martial art Taekwondo and questions why she did not resist or try to escape. It's a puzzle that has tormented many of those involved with the case. Kita tak boleh katakan mangsa patut lawan dia, ada masa lari, ada peluang lari. Mata dia lari. Memang senang cakap dia boleh lari. Tapi nak lari mata pukul 21, 2 pagi macam tu. Keadaan yang dia tidak tahu tempat. Ya, dan dah kena tikam. Hanif's tactic is a typical defense lawyer's strategy to continue creating doubt. But criminologist Dr. Gashina rejects this speculation. 
you think if I'm in the same circumstance, if I'm in the same situation, I would definitely run away, I would definitely call for help. Well, you're not in that type of situation. You can envision all you like, but reality and imagination are two different things. It's the sheer weight of the prosecution evidence that seals Najib's fate. One especially telling detail is the muslin cloth that was found wrapped around Kani's neck. Simply listed as a bandage, Salehuddin reveals that it might in fact be vital evidence linking Najib to Kani. Najib was working as the supervisor. They used a special cloth in order for them, for them to clean the window of the plane. So um, I suspect that the same cloth was used to tie either the neck of the victim or the wrist of the victim. The prosecution team present forensic evidence that confirm the muslin cloth used to bind Kani's hands and mouth was in fact the same cloth investigators found at Najib's workplace. By the end of the trial, the prosecution case has relentlessly presented to the court a stream of potent forensic evidence. It is now time for Najib to enter his defense. All Malaysia wants to know how he will plead. On August 6, 2004, one of Malaysia's most dramatic trials has reached a climax. Ahmad Najib bin Aris stands accused of murdering 28-year-old Kani Ong. The prosecution has presented a powerful case against him. Now, he must decide whether he will take the stand. The defense team, headed by Hanif Katri Abdullah, is in a tough position. Six of us had to sit down and uh, evaluate what would be the best option available to Ahmad Najib bin Aris. After six long weeks of deliberation, they finally present the options to Ahmad Najib. He has the ultimate right for his decision. He can decide to go against the lawyer's advice. We told him the importance of him to be voluntary in making the decision because his life is at stake. After considering the advice of his legal team, Najib makes his decision. He opts to remain silent. There has been high drama in court before, but none like this moment. What does Najib say? No, I'm not going to take an oath, not going to say anything on oath. I don't want the prosecution to cross-examine me. I'm not going to say anything from the accused stand in my defense on this charge. The prosecution interprets Najib's astonishing decision as tantamount to an admission of guilt. What they did is to remain silent and not to rebut at all by calling other witnesses. They are not calling anyone. They just simply close the case, not rebutting the evidence. So I said, the law said that if unrebutted would warrant a conviction. But to this day, Hanif defends the advice he gave his client. Does it mean Ahmad Najib bin Aris saying that, yes, judge, whatever you decided is correct? No, it does not mean that. If it means that, then the right to remain silent is not a legal option. By the end of the trial, the court finds the prosecution has presented an undeniably strong case against the accused, Ahmad Najib bin Aris, who shockingly chose to remain silent in his defense. In February 2005, Ahmad Najib bin Aris is found guilty and sentenced to death. For Kani's family and friends, the conviction brings some closure, but nothing can make up for the loss of a friend, a daughter, a sister. When the verdict was handed out, it really felt that, you know, we had closure, okay, that finally um, we've come to an end of this, this episode. So, but I mean, no matter what, it still doesn't really take away the, the pain of losing my best friend. I think he is uh, hung or not. He can't bring back Kenny. But I, actually, I don't understand why he should murder her. What has she done? Today, a handful of ardent conspiracy theorists still maintain that Najib did not murder Kenny and claim that her killer is still at large. 
but criminologist Dr. Gashina is convinced the right man was convicted. If he had not been caught, he could have committed a crime again. This type of psychopathic killer will kill again once the personal euphoria connected to the crime wears off. So I'm very thankful that we actually caught him before another woman out there became his next victim. Head of CID Abu Bakar Mustafa is also certain that Najib is guilty. What's more, he has information revealing that Najib had offended before. Ada maklumat mengatakan bahawa Najib dikatakan ada kaitan dengan beberapa kes rogol lain. Itu lebih kurang tak tak kurang lebih tiga lah. But Abu Bakar was unable to pursue these cases as the victims declined to cooperate. Setengah-setengah antaranya telah pun berumah tangga. Ada yang juga tidak mahu perkara ini dibangkitkan lagi. Jadi perkara itu di, disenyap begitulah. After six years on death row and two failed appeals, there is one last chance of life for Ahmad Najib, the clemency of the Sultan. Before the ruler of the state, His Royal Highness, the Sultan of Selangor, makes the decision whether to pardon him or not, Najib is given permission to write him an appeal letter. Once you have taken a life, where else do you go? You can't go anywhere else. So once you have achieved that, to him, as the end of the road, why not kill me? For those who are privileged to know her, Kani's spirit and life remain an undying inspiration, an inspiration that Najib failed to extinguish. Even until now, she still inspires me. And I always say, well, if, if I don't know how to react to things, I'll just say, well, how would Kani do it? She still gives me a lot of strength. Yeah, I miss her a lot. It's difficult. Yeah. For Canny's mother, Pearlie, she has dedicated the rest of her life to remembering her daughter. She was really a very good daughter. We were very close. You see, when you lose someone, your biggest regret is not being good enough to that person. Oh, I like a candle for her every night. I think of her as though she's uh, alive, that's all. I, I still sometimes pretend that she's still in America.